Welcome to the Sanctuary Podcast, hosted by Angel Deer. In this podcast, we explore the mysteries of spirituality and consciousness. In each episode, we dive deep into the realms of human experiences, our rapidly changing world, and the unseen realms, tapping into the universal wisdom that connects us all. Whether you're a seasoned spiritual seeker, starting to awaken to the possibilities of a more expansive reality, or want support on your journey, this podcast is for you. Join me as we explore topics such as shamanism, spiritual transformation, holistic healing, the medicine path, energy healing, plant medicine, ancient wisdom, and more. Our guests are respected elders and experts in their fields, and we'll learn from their insights and experiences as we journey together on the path of spiritual growth. If you can, please consider supporting this podcast by joining our Patreon page at patreon.com slash the sanctuary and why. Once again, it is patreon.com slash the sanctuary and why. Now, let's dive into today's episode. Dodo, I'm so excited to be with you today. So welcome. Thank you. This is probably one of my uh, favorite subjects, trauma, and people always find it really weird (laughs) because I feel this is a field that got me to really starting to understand myself and how I show up for myself, how I show up for the world, for my families, for my relationship. And in fact, it was not until I started diving into shamanic healing work uh, and then later on onto breath work. And we had a little convo about breath work before we started today. Uh, ceremonies that I started to really understand the complexity of it. So we call this talk the mystery trauma. I wanted to call it the magic of trauma, but it feels a little bit, I don't know, people don't like how to say that. Uh, but I found so many gifts in my trauma and in, in the healing of it. Uh, but first, you know, before we go into the depths of that conversation, I would love to hear about what brought you to become a trauma therapist, interested in dedicating your life around trauma. And yeah, was it something that through your personal experience that you were trying to heal your own trauma and you're like, man, I want to study it? Or what was it that brought you there? Yeah, first of all, thank you for uh, the invitation. It's an honor to be here and have this conversation with you. And I can relate to everything you shared so far, the the passion about trauma. And I get the same thing. People are like, really? How can you be so passionate about trauma? But of course, yes, they are. (laughs) There are people like us. Um, and yes, I have a, a deep, um, not only gratitude, but honor to, to this and what it is. And, and I've the same, I relate to what you say in terms of, we keep all it, we talk about the mystery of trauma, but the same, the magic of it. And I think it has both the mystery, the magic, and so much nuance and complexity around it. Now, in regards to your question of what brought me to it, yes, it was my own, my own journey. And interesting enough, it was my, um, what really awakened a lot of my adaptations was going into entrepreneurship. So my background is in law, in IT, corporate, uh, in the city of London. And when I... Sounds traumatic already. Yeah. Plus, uh, yes, I'm moving into a different country, lots of stuff. Yes. But moving um, from a corporate environment after yes years of already traumatic experiences in there on top of other stuff and moving into entrepreneurship there was so much that we brought up and most of it in terms of patterns of overworking comparison uh stress uh relationship to money but also in terms of visibility and showing up and sharing your message and at that point, when I started and I got to learn about this, I realized that all of the tools that I had until then, in terms of coaching, lots of other stuff, they weren't working. So anytime kind of the mindset work that I was doing, they weren't working. And I started to wonder, what is going on? 
why in a way I have so much stress or so many survival mechanisms came online that I couldn't, I wasn't able to soothe or to calm or to heal. And then I was in a way fortunate enough with mentors to really get to understand and to know about trauma, but specifically about how that impacts the nervous system, but also about developmental trauma. So for me, it was actually learning a lot about developmental trauma in that how trauma or whatever we experience is stored in our body. And that was fundamental then for my own experience to understand, oh, okay, then my responses in the present moment made so much sense. But then to also begin to explore perhaps what are the things that I have experienced that I never considered they were traumatic, or I never looked at them, realized, oh, they actually have impacted me then, but very much right now. Because that's another thing with trauma. We do not have to go and dig in the past. If we take a moment and we slow down to look into our lives now, we will see those patterns being lived in the present moment. And this is something that I learned then to work, working in the present moment, whatever will come, will come. But to really get to, to embody that. So yes, it was my own experience. Yeah, it's really interesting what you're sharing because for probably more than half of my life, I could see certain ways of relating in relationship, my relation to men, especially strong, physical, strong men. Uh, some sense of not being safe, some patterns, right? Uh, that were probably not clear when I was in my 20s, but got more clear when I was in my 30s, I guess, that I could not really explain based on what I knew about my childhood, my family system, my education, until late in the game, I would say literally less than 10 years ago, where I discovered I experienced sexual abuse when I was uh, a young teen, that I completely forgotten about it. Like literally, I have no visual memory of it. Somehow my brain completely isolated that event, despite doing a lot of ceremonial work, a lot of things. I never really saw it until one day I saw it. Somehow my body, I felt, was ready to show me a piece of it. And then I could explain and understand why am I showing up that way? You know, what is it? that makes me feel that way in certain situation. So I want to ask you a little bit about that because the word trauma is used a lot now, kind of probably overused. So I want to ask you the definition of it as uh, someone that is a somatic trauma therapist, because it feels like every time we're hurt or something bad happened in us, we call it trauma. And people that have been really traumatized, people that have gone through really probably something we would consider I don't know, like war or genocides or rape, you know, things that are were very violent and say, well, this is trauma, you know, a heartbreak with your ex 20 years ago might not be trauma. And or someone say to me one day, well, you know, someone that's emotionally abusive, it's not really the same as someone that's physically abusive, right? So I don't agree with that, but... Uh, so I would like, yeah, ca can we define it? Is there is there like a really clear definition today about what it is and what fall into the category of trauma and what is really just basically life experiences that might be difficult and not qualify as something that we would call trauma? Yeah, sure. First of all, no one agrees on the definition. Okay, great. <laughs> So even the the big uh, yes the psychiatrists big uh, teachers that talk about trauma out there they, there isn't necessarily like a dictionary mm -hmm. definition of trauma. Um, in a way, that's good news because in a way that it's nuances. It's not uh, like the definition in the DSM five, but at the same time, then you can bring a lot of nuances and a lot of conversation. But I want to say, first of all, is that trauma is in a way complex and nuanced. But yes, there is a, there is a difference between a traumatic event, so something that happens, that's the event, yes, something that happens. Like you said, it could be an abuse, physical, emotional, or whatever. It could be war. It could be an accident. It could be a divorce. It could be a neglect. It could be relational. It can be systemic. It could be culturally, yes racism, oppression, all of that. So those are the events. There can be just one event. 
So that's more like a shock trauma, like accidents, or natural disasters. Or it can be more complex. Complex, which means they're repetitive. They're the, the thousands of the paper cuts, as I call them. Mm -hmm. So those are the events. But then what happens from the event, what happens is how our body responds to it. So that's the event that impacts us, and this is how we respond. Yeah. So the shock comes in, and then what happens to us. And this is, in a way, what trauma is. It's not what happened. And Gabo Mate talks a lot, a lot about this. It's not what happened. It's how our body responded to it, or how your body and mind responded to it. So anything, in a way, that's considered, or we can experience it as overwhelming, stressful, where we didn't have capacity to deal with, that becomes traumatic. Or it has the potential to become human. And also from relational uh, perspective or from attachment theory, another way we can think about trauma is who was or who wasn't with you before, during, and after an event. Mm. I love that part because I don't know, I was reading about a study that was done a few years ago about a car accident and how some people um, go through some time quite big car accident let's say they do rollovers you know it's quite traumatic but let's say they survive it physically and they get out of it and somehow they are able to go back on the wheel and drive a car pretty rapidly and some people maybe had an accident that was not as dramatic as intense physically right maybe the car got crashed and but somehow 10 years later they still have panic attack, even just being in a car or being in a situation that looks like it. And in the study, they were showing that the difference between the people that have PTSD, so post-traumatic syndrome after and those who are not, the main difference, there was a couple, but the main was, was that someone was on the side of the accident talking to them quite immediately. Like someone stopped. It was not an EMT. It was not a professional. It was just a random person that was just able to stop and talk to them. And some people had to wait five minutes, 10 minutes, 20 minutes before someone could engage verbally with them. And the people that have had some kind of social engagement, some kind of discussion right after the event, or in fact, sometime during the event or right because there was someone in the car that could talk to them, those people had less PTSD had less trauma, despite sometimes they had a way more catastrophic, you know, maybe injuries, right? So that talk a little bit about what you're saying, right? What happened before, during, and after. And the second thing in that study was if the people in the accident had already some level of trauma before that. Yes. Maybe they were not in a good family household when they grew up, right? And they they were abandoned or they were abused and things like that. Those people were more subject to having PTSD after the car accident than the others. Yes. And thank you very much for mentioning that because that's those are very fundamental points. One is that, yes, we need that social engagement. So like you said about having someone with there to attune to us, to be there with us and help us feel safe. Because through the eyes, through the voice, the physical presence, we get to feel safe because we are social creatures. But the other thing is that, yes, most of the, most of the time, and they've done many researches on this, is that what makes a difference, how we, in the way we respond or how we survive a shock trauma, i.e. an accident, a fall, a big event, something, is very much based on what are the previous traumas we had. So on top of the a shock trauma, a lot of it lies a lot of developmental trauma, so a lot of relational trauma. And if we had a lot of relational trauma, then any kind of, yes, accident, uh, fall, or other relational traumas that come after that, they will trip us over more than someone that had a secure attachment, that had a good childhood, let's say, relatively good, because none of us had. Yes, in the developmental trauma club, most of us uh, yeah. are, uh, are in. Um, if those people, in a way, had more healthier upbringing, then they're able to, they have that resilience built within them, and they can pass previous uh, after after events more easily. So basically we're not equal obviously in the face of one event mm -hmm. uh in terms of how we're going to respond. And what seems pretty clear to me is that we cannot judge the severity of the impact based on the severity of the event, right? 
Yes, very much so. And the same, they can be two people, three people, 10 people experiencing the same event at the same time. And I can guarantee you each one of them will respond to it differently in that moment, a day later, a month later, or 10 years later. Yeah, it's really interesting. You know, in the past year, somehow I've been working a lot with veterans. I don't know how it happens, but, you know, many ex-Marines somehow found their way to me to support them. And I've been working with uh, many of those men. And when I talk to them about the platoon, the group of men that was with them, maybe in the car that was there during the attack, or, you know, a lot of of those men were deployed in Afghanistan or in Iraq. And they're telling me, well, you know, I somehow didn't really see exactly what happened, but it's been 10 years since I'm back and I'm still on high alert. My body is still you know, kind of checking the room all the time and any loud noise brings me back where one of my buddies that was with me in the car that somehow got injured uh, is living a perfect life. I mean, is living a more normal life, let's say, and doesn't have that impact. And, you know, there's something about, and maybe it's the way we treat trauma or we look at people that react or that experience turmoil with their emotions, with anger and other things. But there is very often, I feel, and I don't know if it's called trauma, but the perception of the collective or the group when people have experienced this, that brings more shame. And those people feel that they are not as good, that we might not be as good as responding to what happened because some people somehow responded better in that situation. And I feel it had a level of shame a level of difficulty to navigate trauma. And I found that with very trauma victim, very often people not only have difficulty navigating what happened, but also have a very big difficulty navigating the response of the collective after that event. Can you talk a little bit about that? Is that a trauma potentially? Can it add to the trauma? Uh, we very are to so. be welcomed or seen? It very much adds to it. And that's another thing that I wanted to mention earlier. So thank you for bringing it into the conversation. If there's another way we can think of trauma is trauma equals shame. So another thing is what are the things that we're ashamed of in our life or about our experience? But what happens is, is that that shame is usually not ours. It was how we were shamed. So like you said, when, when we are shamed, yeah, so the going to the collective, other people shame us for you know, being good at comparison or through various ways. We internalize that and that becomes toxic shame. So in a way, we don't say, I did something wrong. We begin to say, I am wrong. So we internalize it. And that's another way that trauma manifests. So when we perhaps already had that and then something happened and then we can get another wave of shame that adds trauma on top of trauma or that adds shame on top of shame and that's usually not our shame but we internalize it because we don't know what to do with it and if we keep on being told the same messages we start to believe them Mm. and and the same another way we can think about trauma is trauma it's also not only shame but also heartbreak it's everything that we do when we close our hearts Mm. so in a world that is quite dysregulated to say the least Mm. That definitely is quite violent, you know, and I'm talking not just violence on people, but on individuals, on groups, on communities, on the environment, on the earth. Even, you know, there's a lot of discussion now that the capitalistic system, because of its competition and pressure. And exploitation. Yeah, exploitation is interestingly violent and that creates activation of potentially fear and anger and triggers in our bodies. When we are in an environment that creates a lot of shame too, a lot of rejections, uh, you know, like what Gabo Mare said in his latest book, right? The myth of normal, but there is an idea of normal in our society that if you're like this and you can be a good girl or a good boy and behave a certain way that you are normal. And if you can't, for whatever reason, you're not, you're broken. So I'm seeing that also as adding more shame and rejection. How do we navigate our own trauma in that space knowing that we are basically rarely put in places and space where we can experience real safety relaxation Mm -hmm. belonging connection which are necessary in order for to heal our nervous system and our traumas yeah so how do we do that is by first of all wanting to do it that although the world is 
as it is, to look within, to go inside, and also find that flicker of hope that through doing my own work, I can bring my own value and I can co-create. I can support through my own regulation, through my own healing, just another one person more that can help the others. Yeah. So think of thinking about yeah, to move from this individualistic perspective, which is very much a capitalist notion, to look more into the the co-creation, the collective, into groups, into communities. But of course, in order to do that, it's important to also do our own work and connect with our bodies, connect with ourselves, heal ourselves, because once we do that, we feel safer to be with others. We're more open to listen to others, to listen to their perspectives, to be curious, to connect, and to feel safe. Because of course, to connect, we need to feel safe. And in a way, how we do that, very much I would say is to slow down. Because I, I take it most of us, or all of us, live in capitalist countries, which is all about, or Western societies, yes, which is all about rushing, going very quick, very fast, more and more and more. This, this place of never enough. And that creates a stress response in us. And in a way, the adrenaline and the cortisol, we get in a way wired on that. Yes, we get addictive to that. So the first step will be just to begin to slow down when we can. Because I understand their pressure, they understand there's work to do and families to feed and kids to look after, just to begin to slow down. Because only in the slowing down, we can notice our thoughts, but we can also notice our reactions, our responses. We can begin to notice what happens from the neck down. Mm -hmm. And in order to do that, we can also, very important, the fundamental work is about connected to the environment, orienting to the spaces we're in, feeling the feet on the ground, noticing the breath, not necessarily changing it, just noticing it. Because the nervous system very much operates below the level of awareness, below the level of consciousness, yes? And in order to notice if the nervous system with our body sends that response of, oh, it's a danger, you better be on the watch out, or, oh, it's safe, we need to slow down. Mm -hmm. And I very rarely say we need to, but this is what we say is one of those times when there's also things we need to do or I, I would encourage to. Yeah, there is this um, quote that's coming from the Bhagavad Gita. And so very old, you know, 6,000 year old text that says we never really encounter the world. All we experience is our own nervous system. So that slowing down, that feeling into the body. Can we talk a little bit more about what's really going on in a nervous system yeah. without going through maybe the whole polyvagus polyvagal theory, but kind of for the people listening, understanding a little bit the systems that are out there and how do they work. And when we do somatic practices, maybe when we do breath work, when we do slowing down, what is it that's happening in the nervous system? What gets activated? What gets slowed down? So how does that create an opportunity for, for healing, for transformation? Yeah. So first of all, we can think about the nervous system as the foundation of life, is everything that we do and everything we experience is done through the nervous system. And even everything that we feel, 80% of what we feel, but also what we think, it's influenced by the nervous system. So the same with, with the quote is like, okay, if the nervous system is basically life and how we operate from, no wonder then that everything we perceive or how we interact is influenced by, by that. So the nervous system is fundamental to life is what helps us breathe it was it's what helping us move yes now if i'm noticing the thirst me being able to reach out and grab the bottle of water it's my nervous system that's the somatic nervous system reach when i swallow the water when i eat it's the nervous system parts of the nervous system that help me digest to speak now looking into your eyes and looking at you connecting with you that is done to the social connection, to that safety of the nervous system. If, for example, in the room that I'm in, and someone comes in unexpectedly and opens the door or starts shouting or anything, I will probably, I might jump, I might hold my breath. That's what a nervous system does. I might disengage with you and look for the threat or look at the door. That is my nervous system doing it. So it's fundamental to me. You know, one of the things I have trouble with is, and maybe it's a, 
because I have trouble in general with the reductionist vision of our biology and nervous system even that obviously I do carry my nervous system right, but because it's a little bit like an antenna that is constantly listening to what's mm-hmm. happening around me, feeling it, probably there's other things that I'm not even aware of, right? In the listening, the kind of listening that the nervous system does on the bodies around me and the environment. That really, when I say my nervous system, it's really not just mine. It's kind of the mycelium of the mushroom where it's connected to many other things. And I feel like we cannot really just isolate that from what's going on in the collective. We cannot really isolate it from what is happening in the world, even if we don't want to listen to TV and news. And I always say, even if you're living at home and listening to nothing, If something happened in the world, we have some level of perception. It's a very shamanic perspective that because we are interconnected, even if I'm not perceiving the forest burning in Canada the whole summer, or maybe I saw the smoke, part of my system of awareness is receiving that information and is asked to process that information. Can you tell more about that? And I don't know if it's purely a a spiritual perspective on that or if there is I mean, I know there is some science around that too. Now we know know that, right? But can you talk a little bit more about that, especially in the context we're in at the moment? I feel like everybody's quite activated. We have this war going on in the Middle East and many people, some are Jewish and are experiencing it, you know, some are Arabs and are experiencing it, but also some people maybe are, you know, are not connected to that land or to those religions but still are experiencing some level of dysregulation and pain and maybe terror, right? Yes, absolutely. So the nervous system, one of its fundamental principles, uh, the fundamental way it works is like it listens inside, in, inside, inside the body. So to the organs, to the breath, skin, to the muscles, the bones, to everything inside, to the, the blood. So it listens inside. It also listens outside. So what happens in the environment and the environment can be in the room I'm in, the house I'm in, the neighborhood I'm in, the country I'm in, the continent I'm in, or even further. So you can think about that. But also it listens in between. So relationally, it also listens relationally. Yes. So this is in a way then we can think about or reflect on then no wonder that if something happens doesn't matter where in the world at some level we will be we might be experiencing somehow and we may not have conscious awareness to it we may not have language for it and we may not have words for it but inside we will have an experience of it Mm. yes and the same through attachment theory and interpersonal biology like daniel siegel talks about so he called it the the intro we so that thing where we're basically individuals but we also in a way how we come into relationship how we feel safe and seen and attuned with others and by others and that's also done through the nervous system through our bodies but also the nervous system is kind of it has electricity yes it communicates through the nerves the nerves and the cells have electricity also the nervous system it gets a bit creepy, but also the central, the nervous system is also fluid. So the cerebral uh, spinal fluid is still part of the nervous system. Hmm. And that's where life gets created from. So this is in a way when, yes, when we can look at our nervous system from a biological perspective, but also that when, when we take it from biology, or we can take it also more in terms of, yeah, take it more into the spiritual realm. Hmm. Because it is, and the nervous system is also very it's like a spiritual path. Yeah, more, I mean, the, in the animistic or shamanic path, the, the fundamental law or let's say the foundation of it is that we are in relation. There is interconnectedness with all of creation. And that means human beings, but also the environment and the plants and the animals and the wind and the sun, you know, just everything that is out there. So we often share that and that's, Part of most of the practices there are healing, but they're not called healing practices. They might call rituals uh, or ceremonies of honoring the earth, for example, and making offering and all of that are in fact deeply healing because we are expanding the 
belief of separation, the wrong belief of separation into our relations because we understand that because we are in connection and related, whatever I'm doing out there, whatever it is that I'm reaching out to is in fact an expansion of my body. I'm, I'm the wave on the ocean, right? To take another terms from another tradition. So when we look at that, I've always been quite fascinated that the more I slow down, the more I practice mindfulness, somatic experience, like literally going into my body and scanning for every feeling without really judgment, just say, oh, it's interesting. It's pulsating there. Oh, it's interesting. I feel this little burning in my chest or my right hip as this sharp pain. If I really allow to stay there and slow down, it somehow always open a message, a, a connection to something that feels that it's coming from way beyond my body. And yet it's happening through that portal. So can you talk a little bit about that connection between the somatic experience, I guess, the feeling, the sensation, the response of the nervous system, and this kind of bridge, I guess, into non-ordinary realities or altered state of consciousness, however we want to call them, right? Yes. Um, and the same, it's a subject that um, fascinates me and interests me uh, as well. And the same through my own experience. And before I, I, I talk about that, I also want to mention, like you said earlier, that in a way that even the shamanic rituals and, and practices, and they're very, very healing, and they are, that they are. And one of the reasons they are even from the nervous system or um, a somatic trauma healing perspective is because trauma, for example, we can think of it as disconnection. Right? So when we experience something traumatic, we disconnect from ourselves or from parts of ourselves, from others, from the world, from the environment, from the spirit. And that's why, in a way, having practices, having rituals done with intention, with the offerings, all of those rituals, they actually help us to reconnect. And the more we reconnect, the more we experience healing. Because reconnection is healing, is the opposite of trauma and disconnect. But do, same, we, uh, do we really understand? Is there any science? I don't need it personally, just to be clear. But is there yeah. like... Uh, because I experience it to be true, so I don't really need a, 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 an equation or kind of a, a map of how it works. But that when I'm doing that, let's say, offering to the earth, uh, when I go to Peru, you know, one of the big things we do is this really big offering to the earth. Right? And as we do that, and the ritual is around one to two hours, and it goes, it's very beautiful and complex and with flowers and different kind of things we put on the earth. But as I do that, I can become very emotional, touch upon my own grief, let's say. Or I can remember an ancestors. I can, you know, connect to my family. I can, you know, things are happening in my system mm -hmm. as I do that. Is it a response of the earth back to me? Do we know, do we understand maybe what might be happening when we reconnect to the sacred in certain ways that somehow allow me? to reconnect my own part in my system, what is happening there? I don't know in terms of research, in terms of you responding to the earth. Mm. But what I do know, and I can guarantee, is you responding to the earth, with the earth. So mm. you coming into relation with the offering, with the ritual, with the earth. Yes, like you said, you might be tapping into your own grief. And then from, from a biological perspective or from a mind-body connection perspective, is that in a way that's when we tap into implicit memories, yes, procedural mm -hmm. memories, into let's call them memories or things that are stored in our body. So it's below the level of our awareness. Memories or things that we do not have words for. And when we slow down and when we have, because the same, when you do an offering, when you do a ritual, you're in a safe, it's a container being built, yes, it's a, it's a space that's being built. So then your body, your mind and your body, become safe enough to let things that weren't safe enough or they didn't have the space before let things to emerge so that's why you might be feeling yes vulnerable tender parts of yourself you so, might be feeling more connection and then we might wonder where does it coming from where it comes from from this connection with the environment with the ritual with the intention and with ourselves and we do that by slowing down. Yes. So in a way, when you come in terms of this, how we can we bridge 
the, the nervous system when working with the body and with ancestors or um, accessing uh, different levels of consciousness or altered states of consciousness, as Stanislav Bach calls them, is because all of that, in a way, is stored within our mind. Mm-hmm. And now when I say, and I made a small pause there when I said that it's stored in our mind, yes, because even when we access the body, and it's called the body-mind, in the abomatic logic body-mind, in order even to access memories or sensations in the body or anything that's in the body, we can access it, but the way we know we access it is through the mind. Yes? Yes. So when we slow down, when we come into the body, when we notice, yes, a sensation, because also sensation is the language of the nervous system. The nervous system doesn't talk in words, doesn't talk in uh, uh, fully organized uh, sentences <laughs> with grammar and with language. No, we give it language. The nervous system speaking, speaks in sensation. But when we bring words to those sensations, when we slow down, we can bring in association, we can bring in meanings, and then other information can come in. And that's in a way how we how we bridge this by being with the sensations, with curiosity, like you said, with presence, without judgment, without efforting, just being with, and creating this capacity and ability to be with. And the more we are with, then we can allow for things to emerge, messages, images, meanings. And also we, we can begin to make sense of the world, but from a much more embodied way. And I say that not only through my own study, and I remember when I started my, my somatic experience in training, my teacher, but also one of my mentors, he said, oh, and the same with IFS, he said, oh, somatic experience, for example, is deeply spiritual. And I was like, okay, okay, I'll believe you, but I'll have to see it for myself. Mm-hmm. And then I did, because you get when you work with the body such a deep somatic level, you get in a way to even you can get to the point where you are able to notice or to work at a cellular level. And even that cellular level, even from the first cell we are made of in the moment of conception, that's a moment of light. There's a light that's being created. Scientists can't necessarily define that. Mm-hmm. Or we kind of know that is the divine light. So even our cells in our body are divine they have spirit in them and that's when when we slow down and we connect with the body we actually we can connect with the divine with the spirit so i'm really fascinated by that uh i feel like when we experience trauma and we dislocate some of the self some of the sacredness of the self some of the wholeness or holiness of the self we somehow, you know, get away from, from God or from that connection, from feeling good, from feeling whole, from feeling love. And then in that reconnecting, remembering, putting those parts back together, which is basically this kind of difficult but essential willingness to descend into the pain, to be willing to go towards what's being excluded, isolated, rejected. And it could be within us, it could be in our family system, right? It could be in our culture, in our societies. It's somehow when I decide to go to what's been pushed out and I bring it in that I can finally re-experience my truth as a spiritual being. I can experience God. I can find find it in it. Bio Akumulafe was a writer and a beautiful teacher's it says that there is a parallel between us rejecting certain part of ourself that we have shamed and that we don't want to look at because maybe the, we think it's ugly or it's not okay in the way we treat, for example, immigrants. And we push, we built wall, you say we built wall in our countries, around our countries to keep people out because what we're really doing is trying to keep the pain out from our own bodies. Not related to that, but that's how it manifests on the outside, right? Mm. So, yeah, I wonder if you have, you know, something you want to say about that between the parallel and the way we relate maybe to the earth, to land, to borders, to the others. How we have othering, we are othering the world, right? There are the others in that. That is a reflection very often of some inner parts of us that are at war and if inner parts of us are at wars then we're going to create wars in the greater collective yes and we can only look in the world what happens now when we can see the level of trauma we're experiencing or the world is experiencing but a lot of the time and i'm not saying always and 
Jeremy, I don't want to make sort of generalize, but every time in a way when we reject something or we criticize or we look outside the door, that is definitely as a part of us that wants to protect us in some way. But that's also because within us, we haven't found healing or we don't know, or that's a very vulnerable part within ourselves. And I know, for example, also in spiritual, or certain spiritual parts in a way, it's like, oh, it's nothing to do with the other person, just look inside. Yes, it's something to do with you, look with you. There is kind of a truth to that, but that also can be very gaslighting. Mm -hmm. And I always say, it's very important to look both ways. Yes, it's okay to look, to bring in that curiosity to say, "Hmm, what is within me that's being awakened? And I don't say triggered. I don't say triggered. Because it's a, it's, it's something so valuable that's being awakened in us, something that wants us to look at and be with. Yeah? So not triggered, awakened in us. Mm-hmm. Something very, very sacred that's awakened in us. So yes, it's important to bring that curiosity to do our own inner work. And at the same time, to look outside and say, perhaps, hey, this is not okay. Mm-hmm. What is happening in the world? That it in a way got to that. And also in a way that's also called, like this the neck calls it, like in a way this fierce self-compassion or fierce compassion. Yes. Where I can be and I can acknowledge the pain. I can acknowledge and the same in parallel work with my own stuff, but at the same time be an activist, be the change, or say when things are not okay. Yeah. So for example, in for example, with us, yes, if for example you say something to me or you treat me in a certain way, yes, and I don't like it. I could, for example, if I cannot be with my own pain or what's awakened in me, I might retaliate, yes, and I might start fighting with you. That's not necessarily the healthy way to do it, yes. But if, for example, I can take a step back and look at, hmm, what is actually happening here? What is being awakened in me? What are my own wounds, my own developmental trauma that's being awakened in me? And get support or work on myself with that. And at the same time, once I do that, or in the process of doing that, coming or finding a way to come in relatively safe space with you to say, hey, what you said to me, I didn't appreciate, or that's not okay for me. So in a way, that, and that's also part of the self, the self, the spirit's compassion, but at the same time, doing my own my own work. And the same, what is happening in the world is a lot of the, you know, the activation that is happening is a lot of the time is because people, certain people, don't necessarily have that ability or willingness to look at their own vulnerable parts, to look at their own adaptation, to look at their own responses to traumatic events that have happened. And when we don't do that, we will react in very unhealthy ways towards others. Mm -hmm. We do it towards ourselves, but most often it's easier to point the finger and do it to someone else. Mm -hmm. So what are some of the, you know, I want to move now into kind of what are some of the techniques or, you know, you mentioned slowing down, which is a big one. And often people tell me, well, I've slowed down a lot. And I would say, well, then slow down more. Yeah, when you think (laughs) you slow down, slow down a bit more. Slow down a bit more, right? you know, you you use different techniques that you're trained with and certified with. So uh, maybe can you give us a little bit of a sense of what are things that maybe people are interested to go deeper into maybe what's happening in their patterns, in their belief system, in their awakening of things in their body? What are some of the things out there that could be very supportive of that and that people could do, especially, you know, when we're confronted with things that really put us into very unsafe places when we are very activated and maybe feel terror or want to run away or hide or shut down. And that can be quite common. Yes, and it's very common. And also, depending in terms of our traumatic or store survival stress experiences we have, or experiences where we store that in the traumatic stress within ourselves, is that also then if we can get into a pattern or a habit, then we always look for the danger. And we stay into that contraction, intention in our minds, in our body, in our thoughts, in our beliefs, in our relationships a lot. Mm -hmm. And the first thing also to work with trauma is to look at the resources. What does that mean? Things that feel okay. So start to start off with things that feel okay or feel neutral within ourselves or in relationships or in our environment. Yes. So the saying, if, for example, we feel a lot of terror or panic attacks or anxiety, also perhaps 
probably the first thing we'll do is we're going to look in the body where that feels and we're going to feel that intensity. But then to train ourselves to see, okay, and at the same time, is there another part inside of me or around me that feels okay? Mm -hmm. So for example, if I feel like I have a very shallow breathing, I feel my tight, my chest very tightened, I feel my stomach very clenched, my whole upper body is so tied up. But perhaps I can feel uh, my big toe, my right foot feels neutral, feels okay, doesn't have any pain. And just to see if I can be for a few seconds with that, because that also helps us to build this capacity in our vessel, in our container, to be with intensity. Mm -hmm. To see if I can, even if I feel terror, to see if I can slow down and orient myself, perhaps to look at the sky, to look at a tree, to look at a picture, just for a few seconds, because that helps us to be with the activation and it helps to bring in that balance. Mm. Yes, that's one. Second of all, we can really move from judgment and asking ourselves, why do I feel this? To and what happens inside of me when I about this or when I feel it? And to see if we can move into curiosity because judgment and well nobody contract us even more. So it keeps us into that sympathetic fight or flight energy even more. While curiosity, it opens up our channels. We're more receptive. We can allow new information to come in. So curiosity is very, very important. Another thing is just to slow to slow down, but in a way to relax the muscles around the eyes and to orient to the space. Yeah? So lift my pace off the screen or what I'm doing, just to take a moment to really notice the environment I'm in, either inside or outside. Because that sends the signal to the nervous system that whatever might be happening, whatever real or perceived threat there is, perhaps there is some level of safety in mm. my environment, mm. in the room that I'm in, in this moment that I'm at. And so that's why to and to develop the vocabulary of sensation, which is the language of the nervous system. So to notice the temperature, yes, and even the temperature of the body, maybe the hands are um, are Colder, but maybe the, the front of the body is warm and how warm it is, and there is tension, tightness, but also coolness, um, floating, um, open, fluids. So, to really develop this vocabulary. And also, whenever we notice either thoughts or sensations or emotions that we have, to know that it's not the whole of us, it's just parts of us. Parts of us that have been awakened because they need our attention. Mm -hmm. And whose attention do they need? Our self, right? the capital S. That essence, that presence that we are, that divine spark that we are, that God image that we are. It's the us that is the healed one, that is the holy one, the whole one. Mm. And that is the us that has the ability to be with the sensation, to be with care, to be with memories, traumatic memories. And it's also the us that knows it has all the time in the world and all of the resources it needs to heal. And is there open and supportive for all of you. So in that response, let's say we are in the presence of someone that is going through a trauma response, that is going through maybe extreme dysregulation. Maybe we're in a conversation and some go someone gets much more heated and much more activated. What kind of space can we what can we offer to support that you know there is you know for us obviously and is it the same thing like finding the most centered calm place in us what is it that we can do to offer the holding that could help you know descending into that trauma that pain in a safe way first of all the first question that comes up for me is would be if i would be in that situation i would ask myself do i have enough resources in me to be able to do that. Am I in a regulated enough state, in an okay state myself, so that I can hold space for the other person? Mm -hmm. Because if I'm not, I'm not going to do myself a, thing, a, a service and I'm not going to do the other person a service. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that would be first. Another thing would be okay, even if I'm not, but I still want to be there for my friend, for my partner, for whatever that person is, maybe I don't need to say anything. Maybe I can just be there. Because that's another thing. A lot of the time, we have this impulse that we want to help. But this helping, a lot of the time, is from fixing. We want to take away people's pain. We want to fix them. We want them to get rid of something. Uh -huh. And if we're operating from that space, I can guarantee you, I'm, we're not going to be of any service. Because that can activate 
a lot of the unconscious memories when that person has been through that situation he's not going to be seen he's not going to be hurt he's not going to be feel validated he's not going to be safe yes mm -hmm. so what we can do is like even if we don't feel like we're regulated enough maybe we can say look i cannot hold space for you let me come back in five minutes i can go and ground myself but even if i'm there perhaps i don't need to use words perhaps i can just be there just letting the other person feel the present. Perhaps I can come into my heart and do some coherent breathing. Breathing in and out through the heart. Slowing down the heart. And knowing that when I do that, and if I'm envisioning opening my heart, the other person will feel that and it will help them. Yeah. Just looking at them. So being there, looking at them without saying words, mm. you can help another person more, sometimes more. A wise teacher told me years ago, he said, you know, the... The healer in the room is the person who is the most regulated nervous system. Mm -hmm. it's, it's because I was, you know, asking all the skills and the things to know and learn. And he said, well, it's not really that. That said, you know, obviously to learn self-regulation and to cultivate it uh, require a lot of skills and practice. But I say, yeah, it's not the one that knows the most about trauma in the room. It's the person that has the most regulated nervous system that will be able to allow others to kind of relax, I guess, into the space more because there is space for it. And that goes back to this connection between nervous system, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. And then, yes, and that connection through the nervous systems is for co-regulation. Because even if, for example, if I am not regulated, now, or I'm dysregulated, if I have another person that is even a bit more regulated, that can support me to feel more regulated. Only through that presence. Yeah, that's beyond the verbal, right? It's the capacity of our nervous system to talk to each other without us saying anything. Yes. Yeah. So once again, we can also, in a way, think about it as the same. This one doesn't have language, doesn't necessarily something that we can test, but we feel it. And this is in a way where also this work is very spiritual. Yeah, that's really the mystery of it here, right? There is something that's happening that we don't have access to, that we don't see, mm -hmm. that is really beyond the self, that is bigger than that. But we very much can feel. Mm -hmm. You know, I think we're going to and around those worlds because I really like to live it in that place. And is there anything else you wanted to share today on that topic? Things that maybe people need to know about and we'll be sharing your details and the work you do below those recordings, but maybe something else you want to bring into the conversation today. Mm. There's, um, there's something else in the air in terms of reading the way Understanding the mystery of trauma and the magic of trauma is the spark of healing that we take. It is about, in a way, us having more access to self-agency, choice, which in a way really helps us to be sovereign beings. But sovereign beings not from a place of individualism, from a place of connection. That's beautiful. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for listening today. Thank you so much, Teodora. It was such a pleasure to be with you today. And uh, I hope you guys, listeners, uh, enjoy the conversation. And uh, yeah, I look forward to more discussion around this tender, but magical, mysterical topic. Thank you so much, Teodora. Thank you. It's been an honor. And like I always say, from heart to heart and to all heart. Blessings. Thank you for listening to the Sanctuary Podcast. We deeply value your support. Please consider sharing this podcast with others and joining our Patreon page at patreon.com slash the sanctuary and why. Once again, it is patreon.com slash the sanctuary and why. At the sanctuary, we believe that spirituality is a personal journey that takes many forms and we honor and respect all paths to awakening and the rise of consciousness. Our mission is to provide a platform for open and honest conversations about spirituality and to inspire and empower our listeners to live their most authentic lives in good relation to each other's, the living, and invisible worlds. I look forward to connecting with you again here or at our events, retreats, and online gatherings. You can find all our offerings at thesanctuaryheal.com. Once again, it is thesanctuaryheal.com.